blown from his brow. But Griffith's quantum leaps were preceded both by the development of some baseline technological capabilities that allowed him to envision the form, and by experiments in which other artists sought to shape the new medium in comparison with its predecessors, most notably the stage. The recapitulation of previous forms seems to be an intrinsic part of the evolution of media, as it is to the development of the human individual in the womb. Human embryos have gills and tails before they assume, before they assume uniquely human shape. Likewise, television emulated theater, vaudeville, radio, and film. The emergence of a new medium is a dance between the evolutionary pattern of recapitulation and the force of new creative vision. I want to talk today about the emergence of virtual reality as a medium, and I want to begin by showing you some recent developments in the evolution of a closely related area, what we in the United States call multimedia. Although they differ in terms of their technology platforms and their areas of focus, both VR and multimedia are part of a larger domain, and that is human action in representational worlds. The videotape I'm going to show is an example of some new approaches in multimedia design. Can we have the video, please? <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, this was recorded in 1990 at a conference in, in Linz, Austria, at Ars Electronica. Uh, that was uh, Brenda Laurel in 1990. It's my pleasure. This was also before, um, of course, the World Wide Web became known as it is today, and before Brenda made one of her landmark uh, virtual reality projects in 1994 or 5? Late. 93, excuse me. Placeholder. Brenda Laurel has worked in interactive media since 1976 as a designer, researcher, writer, and teacher. She worked in the computer game industry from Atari to Activision and in research labs at Atari Interval Research, where I came to know her, and Sun Labs, where she was a, a, where she was a distinguished engineer. She co-founded Telepresence Research, a VR research and production company in 1989. With the support of the Banff Center for the Arts and Interval Research, she co-designed and produced the groundbreaking virtual reality system Placeholder. Based on her research in gender and technology at Interval Research from 1992 to 1996, she co-founded Purple Moon in 1996 to create interactive media for girls. She designed and chaired the graduate media design program at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, a position she held from 2001 to 2006, and the graduate design program at the California College of the Arts from 2006 to 2012. Most recently, she served as an adjunct professor in computational media and research associate um, at the Digital Arts and New Media Programs at UC Santa Cruz. In 2015, she received the Trailblazer Award from IndieCade for her distinguished accomplishment over a career of game creation. Her books include The Art of Human Computer Interface Design, 1990, Utopian Entrepreneur, 2001, Design Research, Methods and Perspectives, 2004, and Computers as Theater, 2nd Edition, 2013. She earned her BA in 1972 from DePaul University and her MFA in Acting and Directing in 1975, and a PhD in Drama Theory and Criticism, 1986, from The Ohio State University. Among her favorite activities are snorkeling, landscape and underwater photography, abalone diving, and trekking in open country. Ladies and gentlemen, Brenda Laurel. regardless of what happens in terms of technological innovation, I think they're going to be present as we continue to develop new stuff. And the first one, obviously, is the challenge of personal agency for participants. Um, so back when, oh wait, I'll go back here because in 1975, 
my personal agency involved things like making sure the iron was off when I went for work. I mean, you did that. Did your mother say that? Did I leave the iron on? No? Your grandmother, maybe? Anyway. And then we had TV. We had three channels. We had no cable. Um, what are you doing? Okay, okay. Um, and, and so what could you do to interact with this TV? You could change among those three channels. You could change the volume. You might even do it with one of those newfangled remote control things. And if that didn't work, you could fiddle with the antennas and put aluminum foil on them if you were getting rapid reception. Now, I know I'm the oldest person in the room, so you don't remember this, but it happened. Um, in 1975, I was hired by a little startup computer gaming company called CyberVision. And it was, a, it was a board, basically in a little case that uh, connected to a television set. It was, the program was loaded from cassette tape, which was a problem, as you can imagine. We had two play and usable random machine. So if somebody made a choice, I designed interactive fairy tales at first. If somebody made a choice, you could only carry over a little teeny choice, like what color is the flower. And then you had to go to a converging node at the end of a data load, right, and go on to the next segment. So there was never an opportunity to do anything interesting with the story. Um, and I can remember in those days just being obsessed with this notion of well, what, what is interactivity? You know, what are examples of things that I interact with? How could this grow? I can remember when CyberVision got 16K of RAM, he made jokes about doing war and peace uh, in an interactive way. Anyhow, I started writing about interaction design while I was at the Atari Systems and Research Lab with the Honorable Michael Neymar, mm -hmm. whom I love and have worked with many times. Uh, and I forgive him, by the way, for spray painting me white. <laughs> you didn't see his keynote, that would make no sense. <laughs> so here's the thought. This is the beginning thought. What is, what is a lifelike choice? Let's just start by looking at reality prime. <laughs> the one we're looking at. So frequency has a range, right? You can't do anything ever, or you can do things all the time. Range. You can do only one thing, like the rat pushing the button, or you can do anything you can think of in the environment that you're in. Significance? No significance, like changing the color of the flower in a little fairy tale, or something that can change everything, completely change the outcome of what's going on, the texture of it. Okay, so just so we've got this clear, let me give you a visual example. This is my younger daughter, when she and I were hiking in Zion years ago. So here's a demo. This is frequency. She could do anything she wanted all the time, and she did. <laughs> this is range. You see all these signs that tell you what you're not supposed to do? Well, they, they give you a notion of what you could do. <laughs> so here's that. And then there's significance, which is that one where you fall off the cliff and die. Right? So that's a very significant action. So fast forward to 1993, building VR in Banff, at the Banff Center. Um, this was my eight-year-old daughter's illustration of what VR was after she had walked around in the world. Um, she's 31 now, my grandson. Um, yeah, yeah. So by the time I finished my dissertation, uh, I wrote my dissertation on interactive fantasy in the theater department. I actually had to job somebody in from Stanford who the CS guy because the CS department thought I was crazy uh, at Ohio State. After that, I went to the Atari lab and met Mike and met Scott Fisher, whom you may know. Um, he went on to work at NASA, and there's more of that story later. Um, and I met Rachel Strickland, who's been my long time collaborator on many adventures. So we decided we would propose a virtual reality project to the Dam Center. And by that time, we were working for Interval Research and actually threw down a million dollars, which made the Dam people unhappy. Um, 
So here's a fundamental definition of the art that I use. So a participant can take action in the world and they can see the results of that action. In other words, what I do has some significance in, in the virtual world. If that's not going on, from my perspective, that's not VR. It's immersive cinema. It's storytelling with an immersive background. It's not VR. You can't take action and do something. So my now husband, who wrote a bunch of the code for, for the project in BAM, defined it this way in, in the paper that we wrote in Computer Practice World in 1994. The principle of action is, is about the movement of body and space. It's about what impinges on a sensorium. And it's about being able to make a difference. Now, he got this stuff uh, from the psychologist James Gibson in his studies of uh, visual perception. And then we applied it to VR. Um, and you can see in this picture, there are two participants in the world. Um, so we did three joint worlds with two participants. There's more of that on as well. Okay, so here's a, a description then of the principle of action at work. We can see a lot of things in the world that we can't do anything to or before, right? I do know a guy who could move clouds, but he now lives in Maine somewhere. Um, so we can see more than we can interact with. Here's the zone in which we might take action. So again, here we have reality crime, we have augmented reality, we have virtual reality, those three <coughs> circles overlap, obviously, and this actually comes from Paul Milgram's work in 1992. Uh, if you're interested, it's called Virtuality Continuum. Then we have, down here, linear narrative, storytelling, plays, movies. These are things that you typically cannot make a difference in, unless you're doing an improvisational play, which I've directed a few of. Um, you can't you know, zelling yourself into the movie. Right? You may influence what's going on in the play by booing or rustling your feet, but it's not going to be You don't have the capacity to take significant action in these media. You've got edge cases. I'll talk about a few of those. One of them is theme parks. I'll have an example for you later. And another is dreams. I mean, sometimes in dream you can fly, and sometimes you can't move. You can't breathe. You know, it really depends on the kind of dream you're having, whether or not you can take any action. So I think of it as an edge case. Challenge number two, from my perspective, is being able to create the potential for a participant or more in the virtual world to have what I call a dramatic experience. So I came from the world of theater and drama, and there was, I've got to tell you, there was nothing so sweet. You, you shine a little flashlight around your head and you find both feet of the owner or lady and run nothing. And even though you have these lines that constrain what you say, there's so much freedom in there, in between those lines, in the way you look at your group star or whatever. Uh, accidents happen. I can remember a guy in a big slap ripping my earring up and I saw blood all over him and I thought like I'm getting off stage and it turned out it was gushing out of my ears. That changed a little bit what was going on. Um, but acting, oh my god, it was just like falling off a lot and I loved it. Uh, so when I got involved at CyberVision, it, there was this connection with me. I wanted people to be able to feel that same joy, I guess. Uh, that I did as an actor. So, basically, the story about how I started getting involved in theater in eighth grade, I got sent out into the hall for talking in class, which was a terrible kind of thing that happened, and I wandered over to the theater, and I went backstage, and there was just a ghost light on the stage that night, and there was a flat with this glitter dust star on it. And I, I stuck my nose into it, and I thought, there's a million worlds in here. Mm -hmm. You know what? I want in here. I want to go in here. Um, and it's that same impulse that drove me to work on virtual reality. So I got in there. I did a bunch of acting. Uh, didn't put on the mask, but then become an immersed here and playing a Greek prostitute. Um, I also wrote and directed uh, an interactive version of Robin Hood, which was staged 
in various venues around the Ohio State Bowl. Bowl. So kids followed Alan and Dale, the, the minstrel, to these different venues where things were going on, like little John and Robin having a thing on the bridge, right? The difference was that if the kids or the audience wanted to shout out something, the actors responded to it. I can remember having a, a group of five children show up at, at one of our performances. And they were so acute in their hearing. We had a, a very well-staged broad sort of battle that was going to happen. And he, Robin was supposed to be ambushed, and the kids were going, Robin, there's, there are people behind you. They're sneaking up on you. So the choreography goes out the window, right? It's completely changed the scene. It was delightful. It was delicious. Um, so from there, I guess, I decided to go into theory land briefly in my dissertation to continue to look at this business of getting in there and expanding interactivity and finding that space. Um, my dissertation, which had intended to be about Bernard Shaw, <laughs> like 850 other prominent, turned out to be uh, about interactive fantasy. Um, but I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to build a system that with artificial intelligence, it was informed by Aristotelian dramatic principles, which I knew very well from reading the poetics over and over and over, and applying those heuristically to create interesting next actions in the world. Turned out I was far enough from on a tree because I was thinking about using an expert system. I came here briefly and worked with Joe Bates uh, on his VR work at Cranny Mellon. And he was asking the same question, how can we do this? So finally, I, I thought I had it together, and I wrote this book, Computers and Theater, and then there was that awful paperback that fell down. And it's been 24 years. It had been 24 years when I rewrote it. So some things have happened in there. Right, the internet, massively multiplayer online games, uh, World of Warcraft, you know. On and on, all these things have changed, so I needed to accommodate them in the rewrite. Um, and it's available as some people too, if you feel like looking at it. And I have answered. <laughs> so I've got newly mentioned the PhD to grandma here in this book. So here we go. Let's look at some definitions. So quick definition of a play by Aristotle. This is a 2,350 year old book. Um, and what he's saying is a play is enacted in real time, it's acted out. It has to be acted out within the span of human attention, right? So you put that to a day, and if that's smaller, we lost our attention span. Um, and it, it was intended to create catharsis. That means that you would have building suspense or questions in your mind, and your emotions would become involved, and then some solution space would open up, and you go, oh. Well, in a tragedy, that catharsis was, oh, that poor fucker married your mother. Yeah. <laughs> in a comedy, it's more like, oh, look at that, you know, in, in Moliere, it's laughter and ridicule. Um, he didn't write about melodrama, at least not that we know of. So here's an important thing for us in VR to think about. We are, in fact, talking about people moving their bodies through space in real time. And that is more like a play than a narrative. Epics were narratives in Aristotle's day, and they could last for a week uh, or longer when Homer told his epic stories. So we have this distinction that we start to pay attention to. Let me give you another metaphor. This is a model view controller metaphor. Okay, so here's the model. <laughs> And an example, this is a little world here. This is a world that we just designed for our virtual reality universe. It has affordances in it. It has responsive objects. It has environments. Or if you were writing a Star Trek episode, this would be the world of Star Trek. And you would have to find a path through that world, right, that didn't stray from the Bible. <laughs> but now we're talking about VR. So here's our controller. Looks like an Oculus. And then, it's our view. We've wandered through the world. Somehow or another, we've encountered a bunch of things. Or maybe the next day we take a different journey. Or someone else takes that green journey. What's really going on here is a dramatic experience inside the world. 
And the narrative is the story we tell about a neighbor. So I went in there, and I was following this guy, and then this happened, and the storm began, and we discovered about, you know, this is the story you tell after the experience. You're not having a narrative experience while you're in there. You're having a dramatic one. We hope. So how do you do that when you don't have control over direct authorship of the plot? Because you have an active human being in there with you. So across time, an action unfolds. But let's say this action is just flat. I walk down the street. If you add an axis that we would call complication, that is stuff getting weird, emotions being aroused, mysteries appearing, then you end up with a shape like this. And this is straight out of the poetic. So you have a rising action, a climax where everything is revealed, and then you have falling action. A guy named Gustav Freitag in, uh, in the 18th century uh, gave us a new look at that triangle by adding in Aristotelian anatomical parts. So you can see that it begins to articulate a little more. Why is that important? One reason is you can also read that curve as an information diagram. Okay? So rising line means questions are being asked, falling lines mean questions are being answered. And what you don't want is for it to plunge down to the depths at the very beginning and then go flat, right? So you have to orchestrate how this informational, if you will, approach um, might help you design an experience that's likely to have a dramatic shape. One thing I discovered in my work in theater criticism is that plays are fractal. So the shape of the play, here you see these little bumps, the shape of a scene is likely to be similar. You know, within the range of what a, a fractal similarity is, the hostile dimension. So, for example, in Hamlet, you have this guy trying to make up his mind, and he makes he passes on good decisions, like um, killing the king when he's in prayer. Um, and we end up in this betrayal scenario where he's still making bad decisions and then he's forced into the sword fight with later because he dies even though he knows his orders for him. Well, if you look at the structure of the king in the chapel scene, it has that same shape, right? He, puts, he, he could take action, he doesn't, he overhandles it, right? And then when he leaves, there's a reversal. The king says, I wasn't praying at all. My, my words fly up, my thoughts remain below. So there's irony going on. In every scene in Hamlet, you can find that shape. It's like a fingerprint. And that's another clue for us as designers. As we think about worlds that people traverse, um, what can we do to make shapes like that start to be familiar? It's not that you have to, it's that you can. And it's interesting. So I was talking to Cliff Hawking after I played Splinter Cell Chaos Theory. I interviewed him because that game has a dramatic shape, kind of no matter how you play it. How many of you played it? No gamers! Oh, oh. Okay, so you make decisions early on about who you're going to affiliate with. And that will have a butterfly effect all the way through the game and lead to an inevitable because of the allegiances you do or do not have. The, the player is relatively free to make choices, but once those alliances are formed, they need things from the peasants, they got to be friends with the peasants, the peasants take their fire, you know. It, the shape of the action is intrinsic in, in the world, and the decision that gets made that can change the course of everything may happen very early. Same thing can be true for us as designers. So when we're designing experiences, or designing worlds in which experiences can happen and we want them to be dramatic, we also need to remember that this can wave all over the place and still have that shape, right? So there, there's variability within a constrained uh, space of plot options. <coughs> the most important thing I can say to you today is that the plot, the narrative story that you tell yourself after you've been through virtual experience, um, the plot is an example of time and displaced collaboration between 
you, the participant, and those guys, the designer. And they may have done it 10 years ago, but still, as you work through their world and use their affordances to do stuff, you're collaborating with them to make a plot that shows up in the story you tell. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's a tricky one because now we can no longer like just tell the story for letting people have action. Okay, let me take a little jump out here. So what I did, whoops, yeah, whoops, hot corners, never do it. What I did was, <laughs> so what happens if you take that little line that now knows the shape of a dramatic plot, you want to fold it out so they can go in lots of different directions. This is what is going on in the virtual world, right? Where the plot can go in a lot of ways in my plot. I mean, again, the story we tell ourselves after. Um, so how do you design for this? How do you design to predispose a dramatic shape in any direction someone might have help? So there's some examples. Medieval theory is a 10th century direction design problem. So plays were staged in the 10th and 11th century on pageant wagons. And the pageant wagons might be uh, stationary and might be planted around the town of Slay. Uh, and you would walk by one and see this first verse of Genesis, and then you walk by another and get some other story. And at the end of so each of them has a dramatic shape on each little stage, but you get an overarching dramatic shape by walking past them. Uh, also, these wagons moved. Uh, they would sometimes move through the town. And so the order in which they came by your house might be changed by somebody's first having a problem or whatever. You couldn't control the order in which people saw these things. So you had to be sure that each of them had enough of a dramatic shape that it could stand on its own. And then, in a way, that's a lesson for us as designers in VR now. Uh, let me give you another example closer to my heart. It's designing an environment and that presupposes people to have an interesting, dramatic experience. This is a map of the California, Northern California Renaissance Fair. Mm -hmm. The way that the uh, little booths are arranged on those paths predispose you to different kinds of journeys through that fair. So if you go on the main path from the door, the one that comes up the center, you're going to go by the costume shop. So of course you're going to rent something, unless you're a pro like me, you've got your own gear. <laughs> and then you find the armory. Well, you could buy a knife or a sword, and, and pretty soon you end up at the joust, and you're all like decked out, and you root for somebody, and you're on their side, and you've had a great dramatic experience. Contrary-wise, you may go down the East Asia corridor, see the belly dancers, buy yourself some station clothing, end up at the food court eating food you've never had before. That's a different dramatic experience. All of them have a shape. And when you tell the story later, you know, the five ah, then I had this whole waffle. It was amazing. It was really good. Never had one. And my husband called the other sandwich a gyro. Um, and that was embarrassing. No, he didn't really. So, and guess what? You know, the participants are players in this play. Who's been to a Renaissance fair? Oh, you know them. Did you go as a tourist in a Bud Light t-shirt or did you really deck yourself off? Bud Light. Bud Light. Bud Light. Bud Light. <laughs> it's interesting, in NorCal now, uh, we have guys who are doing samurai stuff, so they go from the same, if they're like Asian folk, will come and perform the same period but from a different country. And so they now have this huge multicultural thing going on. And everybody's tripping, you know, I'm not, not passionate. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was back in the day. Um, but everybody's having a really good time. So this leads me to think about cosplay. Just so you know, I am a trick too. <laughs> uh, I got sit on the bridge when the whole and I great Star Trek thing going on in Las Vegas. And just, I nearly died. They treated it like a holy place. You know, these guys watching it. Or make sure you didn't sit in the chair, take the picture, and then you're gone. Um, but man, that was, that was a rush. Um, and I got into cosplay as a result of that experience as a Renaissance Fair. Cosplay is a lot like what we're talking about, right? So, if you've been, had, who's been to a cosplay convention or does cosplay? 
So, so you know what I'm talking about. There are environments there where you can lay out your character, take the pose, do the action. Who's going to bridge in uh, Shinjuku Station? So you know what I'm talking about too. Like those kids are still dressed up, I assume, um, in their cosplay outfit. So there's a way in which the environment is arranged for the uh, participant as Hector, as character, um, to have a dramatically satisfying experience. And that's just from the arrangement and placement stuff in the world and the affordances that you have. Okay. Action as carry out. Um, go with it. We promised to touch on breath. So breath's idea with the theater of alienation. This is uh, early 20th century, late 19th century. Um, for example, three penny offers a play about a kind of gang boss. And, and the, the idea here that Brecht had was to alienate people from having empathy with the characters. And to make sure they understood that they were watching a play. So the lights were exposed and uh, you could see everything. Um, and his idea was that catharsis, or the final outcome of the play, didn't live in the play. He's prevented you from really caring about these guys that you see some stuff going on. It's supposed to change your mind. And the way it ends is out in the world as you take different action as a result of having seen this play. So it's kind of action as carry up. I'll show you a picture of a, this is a 1972 production of uh, uh, Three Penny on So you can see, there I am, four. Um, you can see the lighting. I always find horrors and crazy. <laughs> so it wasn't that much of a challenge. Um, that's not true. I have to play opium. So you can see the lighting. When this thing started, there were just bars with clothes hanging on them. And we all kind of wandered in our street clothes and started trying stuff on. And the orchestra struck up and it was like, take a pose. You know, the show starts. Well, that night was the eve of the Cambodia invasion. Three Penny Opera didn't have anything to do really with Vietnam except for the kind of imperialistic picture that it painted the budget. That audience marched as a whole to the capital of St. Paul, Minnesota, to protest the Cambodia invasion. So, Brent worked. You know? I'm not sure that would have happened uh, if we'd been doing, you know, you're a good man, Charlie Brown. <laughs> so, that's interesting, and you can see, I mean, in, in games like, I love Bioshock Infinite, I know a lot of people don't, but it's this ugly scene you know, at the World's Fair. Who's played it? Okay, so, and you're kind of forced into this role of, of implicitly collaborating with racism, for example, and you feel kind of nasty when you get out of the game. It's very Brechtian. Your catharsis is going to happen when you go back out into the world. It's not happening in the game, right? So your mind has been changed, and you're doing something out there instead. Both of those ways of thinking about dramatic action, either ending in as an Aristotelian curve, or ending outside of the world, they're both valid, and they can both work as ways of shaping action such that it has a dramatic feeling to it. This is interesting. This, uh, this is an amusement park in San Diego, Mexico, that just opened. It's called Meow Wolf. Anybody heard it? Yeah, okay. So everything in this, this is the construction scene. Let me show you what it looks like when it's done. But everything in the space is interactive. And you have to really touch everything. 200 artists were involved in putting it together. Uh, anything that, like this chandelier is telling you a story about something weird happening, right? <laughs> um, so if you want to find out what happened, you really have to interact with everything. And you can't miss a beat. So the story is embedded in the finding of clues. Now it's kind of a cheat, you know, when you lay the plot down in there and make people dig for it. But it is a way of getting dramatic shape into an interaction. And what's cool about this is it's not virtual. I mean, there's technology behind some of the interactive devices that are used in the employment thing, but it's a, it's a real space, and it's, it's probably better than any of the VR we've done yet. <laughs> um, so it's a good example. Challenge number three has to do with 
this dance between capability and intent. And now we're talking about how we proceed in growing what this medium can do <coughs> and growing it into the next one. Getting to a place where we can transition smoothly from AR, let's say I'm out in my backyard and I'm using my AR device or my glasses to, to identify a tree and I want to see how it looks inside and I put my hand on it and I can go into a model and simulation situation. That should be seamless, right? Or I look down at the roots where I'm in the tree and I want to zoom in and pick these guys up and see who's living there, right? These kinds of transitions are kind of up next for us as technological challenges. They're also they're only going to happen if we're creating designs that intend that kind of transition. Otherwise, that development won't occur. We, by designing for medium, shape what it becomes. So, I want to talk a little bit about the stance between capability and intent. And I'm going to take back to some really early human architecture. Telescope, right? So, some Dutch lens makers in 1608 put together a telescope, and they were lens weenies. I mean, they, they were lens geeks. That's what they weren't. The intent that that was quickly turned to was seeing ships on a distant horizon. Right? You want to see the ships coming before they blow up or down. So, that intention established a capability, the intentions of being lens weenies and seeing ships. Well, Galileo gets a hold of it two years later to totally reinvest the thing. And he looks at the sky with it. New intent, right? New capability designed by Galileo to do that. But then he kind of got bored and went back to his other work for a while. In the 20th century, the telescope has changed once again because we have new intent. We want to see things in the electromagnetic spectrum that are not visible light. Right? So we get um, early on the metallurgical, I'm um, sorry, I'm talking about microscopes. So, um, you, you get gamma ray telescopes, you get large arrays of telescopes that are looking at all different wavelengths. And now the, the, the old fashioned kind seems to be optical <coughs> telescope is kind of outdated. Now look at the microscope. This is Galileo's microscope, which he invented a year before the telescope back then. And again, some Dutch guys were having lens fun. And he had a whole design and played around with it, got bored with it, went back to the telescope. Uh, 60 years later, Robert Hooke, people are still working on the microscope all through this period. Hooke put the microscope through some paces, improved its capabilities, its magnification, because he wanted to look at the structure of natural phenomena that he couldn't see. So these are both stories about seeing the unseen, right? And there's stories about intent. <coughs> so with Hulk, the intent to look at natural phenomena began to dominate the uh, evolution of microscopy. So you get to um, von Leeuwenhoek here. This looks ridiculous, but it's like an even more powerful microscope. And he starts to see these dudes that he calls animacules. It turns out they're single-celled organisms, and this is the birth of microbiology. So intent, capability, doing their dance together. I just love that story. Um, so just this is the historical recap. The Dutch guys, Galileo, Robert Hooke, Van Gogh, and Hulk. Did anybody ever see the Van Gogh and Hulk opera on Saturday Night Live? Oh my god, look it up on YouTube, it's hilarious. Um, and then Henry Sorby comes up in the 19th century, and he wants to look at meteorites, so he invents a metallurgical microscope. Um, and then, you know, all hell breaks loose with the electronic microscope, you know, see things. Uh, I've actually recently seen a video of atoms in motion from the electronic microscope. It's crazy. Again, intent is driving around the development of the technology. So what does this have to say for us? Well, that's it's like a history of the RP from a different perspective than we have before. So this is a is the earliest flight simulator. It's called the Link Trainer. Uh, it was invented around 1934. And it was used to train pilots to fly in World War II. So all it really had was a stick and a guy over there who could make the wings wiggle on so. <laughs> but at least you knew how to use the, the stick, right? So, fast forward 
to the Boeing simulator in 2004. What's, what's happened in, the, in between is that computation got thrown into the mix. So now all of a sudden the instruments can be very specific. They can work correctly and you can use more of them. Okay? And in the meantime, ever since other than have been in the motion platform, it's ADP5, they could move the plane around as if it were in flight. So we've got computation improving the instrumentation. We've got computation improving the view. I mean, originally that guy's sitting in the room, right? And then they use panoramas and dioramas to pretend that there was scenery and models. And then, voila, computational graphics that I could actually make it to a present in the plane. I see this as a real um, beginning point for VR, really, as a simulated world in which a person can take action that can have significance. Um, and that changes what happens. So now you know this guy, but you usually don't see him smiling. <laughs> um, this guy this other one. And his project was called the sort of Damocles, and it was designed in 1967. And it was the, the invention of the optics that give rise to stereopsis, which is really important for total reality. Stereopsis means that you get a slightly different view of each eye. You know this? It gives you depth perception. Um, you can look around and get a real sense of being in a place if you've got both eyes getting a slightly different image and being computed properly. Same thing with audio. Uh, spatialized audio comes around about 1982. Uh, Crystal River Engineering, Scott Foster, were famous for this, uh, where you turn your head and the sound source stays in the same place. I can remember a buddy used to take great, great for that shows for us. And he had microphones mounted on his sunglasses. And you're listening to the tape, and then all of a sudden a band goes up over your head because he was leaning over you and so So that didn't happen, that doesn't happen with spatialized sound. Uh, we'll track. And then we get into the vector graphics version of VR. Uh, first time I saw VR at NASA Ames, it was like little phosphor screen vectors. And somebody had made this great little hack where you just saw these lines standing. But if you got into the G spot, you could see that there was a G. <laughs> but you had to move around so that everything would kind of come together. It was really neat. And I was totally immersed in it. I didn't care that there weren't polygons. But speaking of polygons, next we have, of course, the Silicon Graphics Reality Engine Revolution. And that's, I was lucky enough to get the second one off the assembly line for placeholder. <laughs> Uh, at the top you see, uh, so I should go back. We had some goals of placeholder. We wanted to make, at, at that point in time, 1991, when we were designing this project, we had was used for training. To train astronauts with it, we pull down menus inside the place. Why do you have to ask yourself? Because the capability to take meaningful action, the simulation wasn't strong enough to support it, so you had to select it for them. Uh, but it's still like I have nightmares about it. Um, anyway, we decided that we were going to set ourselves some design goals. We are going to make a design statement that VR could be used for something besides training. And other people, I think, had done some stuff, but we were near the first one. We were going to feature three different worlds and allow people to traverse them. And we were going to let people embody animals. That came from this notion that we got from interviewing people that they felt like they were having an out-of-body experience in VR. Now, I have to say, this was mostly the male people that we interviewed. Female people were more likely to say, I'm taking my sensorium into this world. It's so cool. Right? But the, the lack of a sense of embodiment made us think we got, got it. You're going to have to put your head in one of these petroglyphs, and then you take on its body and some of its sensorium. So, for example, if you became crow, you could fly. Um, and I spent days trying to figure out how to do flight without, you know, magic funny gestures like NASA used. And I asked people, and people would say, well, the height of the But they'd do that. Ah, oh, what am I going to do? And I look at these crows, and they're doing this. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. So I come back and tell the guys, we need flaps. Well, this program doesn't have any memory. We don't know where a flat size and where it is. So we had to build a short-term memory into the system so that they could recognize a flat. And 
And then I became the flap tester. <laughs> so I'd like, get <laughs> foot off the ground. I got just massive muscles under it. Uh, or else I would shoot up above the mile and see it down there as this little big thing. Um, finally, we got the flaps right, and people loved it. At the top here, you see, so we were cap capturing natural environments. The talk about content earlier today was interesting to me in that way. We decided that, that like postcards are indexical to the world, we would build VR that was indexical to the world. But what we would add was all magical stuff, you know, rocks that could talk. Um, animals that knew stuff and had different voices and could swap their bodies and straight up and down. Michael Neymar uh, designed a virtual relief projection in one of our uh, venues, which was a waterfall. So he built this wireframe in VR and then projected video onto it so the waterfall was falling on the time. So if you were pro, you could straight down the waterfall. It was neat. On a good day, we were running at 12 frames a second, by the way. This in the middle is a map of the world. Here you see spider and snake having a conversation, and that's me and Rachel tracking the thing out. So it's like that. Here's our credits, so everybody knows. Um, that's like a capability in a tent. So nature capture. Uh, we tried three different things because we had three worlds. We did tile video dome. We did um, the virtual relief projection, and we also did auditory online with the Kamaltron three-dimensional sound. So you always started in the cave, ah, 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 up, and um, that was auditory. <laughs> and these heterobots were hanging around, come on over here, talk to me, I'm a girl, I'm really interesting, All right? And you'd go over there and you stick your head in it, and you, yeah, now you're a crook, right? And you stick your head in the now you're seeing like a pit viper in the infrared. So that was interesting. Uh, we had the intent of the sense of environment, so the nature will get into animals, so that they would know they had a body. Uh, we have the intent of traversing worlds. Here's an interesting problem. I, I heard some of the filmmakers talking about this earlier. Jump cuts do not work in the <laughs> They're very disconcerting. So in order to get from one place to another, instead of jump cutting, which made people fall down when we tried it, um, we built these portals. And we learned that if you gave people like a second and a half in the corridor, and you're fading out the sound from the last world and fading in the sound from the next world. It worked beautifully. It was a graceful transition for the sensorium of the individual. And the audio gave a sense of traversal. Um, we had the intent of marking worlds, so we created these rocks that you can place stories in. Um, floating rocks with no gravity. And emergent behavior happening here. It's another big deal, right? You can design something you don't know what people are going to do with it. So people would build a little bit of story, and then somebody would come and listen to that rod, and they built another one, and they started putting them in labs. <coughs> so it's big collaborative stories. No idea that was going to happen. Um, we had a user who, or a participant who was straightened out the water balls, crow, and spiders hanging around at the bottom. Just, you know, you just ought to share your body. <laughs> so he jumps into fish, evacuating crow. She gets into crow, and she gets to fly around. Body swapping? Are you kidding? <laughs> no, we didn't think about that. But it was so cool that it happened and that uh, the opportunity for that kind of emergence existed. Shard 80's beautiful piece, Osmos, um, happened a year later with some of the same program. He said, this is her UI. She is a, she is a, a skin diver, but I'm sorry, a scuba diver. And she has the rapture with the deep blue. So she wanted her world to feel like that. And so she created a user interface device that was a belt around your chest, and you could go up by inhaling and down. I asked him. So when somebody got into that brick, they were immediately doing Tai Chi. <laughs> Beautiful, graceful movements. And people would come out of there weeping, saying their life has changed. So that was cool. And that's another case where intent drives capability. And when that capability gets used by somebody else to drive another intent. And so things move around that way. Here's a really recent piece. I don't know if you've seen this. It's called Crystal Reef. It's been done at Stanford, I think. <laughs> so this is a coral reef simulation, and you're swimming. And you, there are two ways you can do it. One is you can follow a guy who's going to identify nice animals for you. But the other is you can just freeform it and pick up a trash like that off the bottom. Clear the ocean, right? Wave things around. So you can actually 
take action that has a kind of response to it in this, uh, in this world. What I love about it is, like, again, it's in depth. It's calling our attention to the health of oceans, right? To the diversity of life in the oceans. And it's a little bit Brechtian in that I think she wants you to take out a new idea about caring for the ocean, about loving the ocean. I can remember um, talking about using VR to sensitize people to climate change at the uh, school a couple years ago, and there was a man in the audience who said, you can't take action unless you have love. And he said, we've forgotten how to grieve about what we're losing. We don't love enough to grieve it. And grief is a strong motivator for action. I never forgot that. I, I don't want grief look kids, you know, that's a different kind of VR, but getting us into a spot where we fall so in love with this amazing world that it changes how we behave, combines the best of Aristotle and Rex as far as I'm concerned. So, capability intent, we have a bunch of machine, right? You know, back to that. This was in the New York Times this morning. Are we going to go here? Are there actions we can take? Getting the model of simulation in the virtual world allows to turn climate models, time models, swim back in time and so forth. I'm sure somebody's built that in this audience. Uh, but I think it's incredibly, immensely important that we have the intent, at least for some of our work, to reconnect ourselves, our bodies, with this beautiful place that we live in. Fall in love with it. Find another way to fall in love. Oh, fall in love with it in a way you never could before, that you couldn't have seen. So that's my rant, and I think of that as guy in the gardening. <laughs> I think what that means is that we become keepers of a guardian pole. We are the eyes of the world. Great for that. Um, we're a consciousness that's been extruded by Gaia. That's not an accident. Just as it's not an accident that we have extruded VR as a technology, it's an extrusion of the human spirit. Let's use it that way. Okay, so greetings from the great state of Northern California. <laughs>